Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with two very special guests. Our first guest today is Virginia Buckingham, and she's here to share with us her new memoir, On My Watch. Now, Virginia was the seventh of eight children born to blue-collar parents. She is truly a self-made success story. She lived in Massachusetts for nearly 40 years and spent most of that time shattering glass ceilings. She was the first woman to serve as chief of staff to two consecutive Massachusetts governors and was the first woman appointed to the head of state port authority, owner and operator of Logan International Airport. She also worked as a deputy editorial page editor and columnist for the Boston Herald. In 2015, she was selected for the inaugural class of Presidential Leadership Scholars, a joint initiative of the presidential libraries of President George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, and Bill Clinton. Finishing On My Watch was her Presidential Leadership Project, a key element of the program, which teaches scholars to apply leadership lessons from those presidencies such as courage and resilience. So let's welcome to the show, Virginia Buckingham. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. You know, it's such an honor to have you here and to talk about your story. And I re- my goodness, once I heard it, I was like, this is a story that really needs to be you know, told and people need to hear this. Well, it took a long time for me to finish writing this book on my watch, 13 years to be exact. And I never planned to launch it during a pandemic, but in a strange way, it seems very resonant with some of what we're experiencing today. So, I mean, I'm sure a lot of times people, you know, they write books and they write information down thinking that they'll keep it for themselves and their family. What made you decide to publish this book? So I'm a writer in my heart. It's what I've always loved to do since I was a little kid. So I couldn't do anything but write my story. And then ultimately, when I came to understand what it might offer to other people who are going through very painful times, I thought, you know, let's do some good with something that happened that was pretty awful. And that's why I decided to put it out in the world. So why don't you share with our listeners about your journey? Because I know, my goodness, I mean, your story is, it's heartbreaking. And I I think a lot of people don't really realize what had happened. So I was the head of Logan Airport on 9-11, where the two planes that took down the World Trade Center towers were hijacked from, and was very quickly put into the middle of a media and political firestorm as people were searching for answers and causes. Unfortunately, it became a bit of a blame game. So I was um, forced to resign from that position, which was shattering in and of itself in terms of my career. But ultimately, I was sued for wrongful death by a 9-11 family personally. Only two people in the entire country were sued personally. And that was really shattering to my heart and soul because the idea that someone would want to hold me personally responsible for that horrible terrorist attack, you know, shattered my sense of self and my sense of self as a good person. And it took a long time for me to understand why I was blamed and to find the resilience to move forward. Well, it's really interesting when these type of really traumatic events happen, there is this, you know, people immediately start to search for, okay, who can we put the blame on? Who's responsible for this? And a lot of times these assessments are made before we have really, you know, the truth of what is going on. No, it's it's a way to regain control. I've come to understand, you know, people were very fearful. They were very angry. And if it could be my fault, if it, if it was because I was too young or too inexperienced to be in charge of, you know, Logan Airport, then they felt safer that perhaps it couldn't happen again. And And that's a very flawed way of looking at things, but it's very common. It's very human. Um, But it doesn't solve anything. And I think that leaders do a disservice when they place blame um, just to assuage fear. And I think citizens do themselves a disservice because it's not solving anything. It's really like a a Band-Aid. Well, and I understand that, you know, once you decided to make a comeback, you got into writing. And then there were some problems there as well. 
you know, I, because I always wanted to be a writer, you know, after I started looking for a new job, a new career, I reached out to some newspapers and ended up um, being hired by the Boston Herald, um, the number two Metro Daily here in Boston. And it was a jo- dream job, job of, of a lifetime, because I got paid to use words and, and what a wonderful thing that is. But it became controversial in its own right in that my fellow journalists, um, signed a petition, 40 plus of them, um, that said that I shouldn't be hired there in part because of my background at Logan. They said, how could I cover issues of security? Um, and, and, and that was really, really hard. Um, but more so, my mentors at the time said, you know, that's a complete comeback that you're in this great job now, you know, so it, 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 it made me hold out hope that perhaps it could be a comeback. But I also came to understand that the pain and trauma of what I experienced and what continued as the lawsuits against Logan continued um, couldn't be erased by any kind of easy answer, like getting a great new job. Well, and, and from what I understand, you know, there was an FBI reporting done that found that, you know, the people at Logan Airport were not responsible for what had happened, right? So, you know, gratefully, the 9-11 Commission did an in-depth investigation, as we know. Um, And when they came out with their findings in 2004, I had met with them and said, if you find that Logan Airport's security is no different than anyone else's, can you please say so? Not just for me, but for the entire Logan Airport community who was held up to this this scrutiny. And they did. Um, They they did. And I I was very grateful for that. Um, Ultimately, the lawsuits against Logan, um, Logan was dismissed from them. Um, And, you know, the strange part was that 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 external exoneration didn't really matter to me deep inside because I needed to exonerate myself. I had to understand that it wasn't my fault. It never was and really hold on to that truth deep inside and no external voice of of validation was going to give that to me. I had to give it to myself. So how did you work through that until you got to the point where you were in a point of like self-forgiveness for all this. So if I had a nickel for every person who said I should move on from what happened, um, I'd be sitting in the Caribbean right now and I'm not um, because I realized I couldn't move on from something that, that horrible. And for a long time, I felt I was failing at being resilient because I didn't feel stronger. I didn't feel better. You know, kind of that cultural um, impetus we put on people when you've gone through hard times, we want them to be okay. So we want them to, to, take the best of their experience and apply it going, going forward. And and that wasn't how I felt. I felt changed forever by what happened. And I had to come to understand that that's a form of resilience too, to accept the reality, the whole of your story, the painful parts and the joyful parts and carry them with you. And, and then you can move forward. You can't move forward by kind of rejecting what happened and slamming a, a door on it. Well, I think it's important for people to hear that because it is a journey when you are going through difficult times. And, and this is kind of the pinnacle of all that. I mean, when people look at, you know, having a difficult time, I mean, you were blamed nationally, publicly for this. And so, you know, being able to get to a point where you're kind of working through all this, I mean, it was a journey. So, you know, I had to learn and understand a few things. I had to really reflect on and understand why I was blamed in the first place. I had to stop blaming myself and hold on to what I knew was true. And I had to understand that my resilience was not our cultural standard. And the metaphor I use in the book for for resilience is sea glass. And I'm very lucky to live near the beach and I collect sea glass. Um, And as you know, it's evolves from a bottle that's thrown into the ocean and is tumbled about in the waves and broken apart and is no longer like it was when it first began. It's no longer um, in any way resembles that bottle, but what's resulting that beautiful sea glass is still a value and still worthy and can bring joy and meaning. And to me, that's resilience. I'm not who I was before this happened. I never will be. It took a long time to accept that but I still can build a life of meaning and value. I really love that analogy. When I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, that's perfect. Because, you know, a lot of times we do go through life's challenges and we're just kind of tumbling around out there 
but it brings us to a place that we never thought we would be. It's it's true. And accepting is a big part of, of that journey and that finding, you know, peace or whatever you want to call it is, is accepting that it's, you're not going to be the same. And that's painful and hard and to let go of whatever your path was or what your hopes and dreams were. You know, I thought I was going to be in a very different place in my life and in my career. I was in public service most of my early career. I expected I'd stay in public service my entire career. Maybe I'd work in the White House. Maybe I'd work in Washington. Maybe I'd run for office. All sorts of dreams that came to an end that day. But I have other dreams now, and um, pursuing those um, is something hopeful, and I hope that's what my story offers. So where did you find hope throughout your journey with this? You know, interestingly, you know, I, I will never underestimate, again, the power of empathy and compassion, um, giving it and receiving it. I, in the course of my story, met many strangers and of course my friends and family and 9-11 families who embraced me and embraced my grief and showed me such compassion that it just offered me a little light to hold on to, to move towards. And, you know, I I talk about um, one mom whose daughter was on one of the planes who, you know, looked me straight in the eye and said, live your life in Marianne's name, her daughter, Marianne McFarlane, who was on United 175. And that kind of grace and compassion from others, I think is the, you know, essence of hope. Uh, I, I really love that because it, I mean, in a culture where it seems like sometimes people are, are a little bit so happy, you know, finding a place of compassion, I think, is where we really need to be at at times, you know? You know, it's, it, especially now, you know, given what the entire world is going through um, with the um, coronavirus pandemic, you know, everyone is struggling in their own ways, certainly in different ways, but to see them and listen to them and show them kindness, I think is, is going to help us get through this. And so our listeners can understand, I mean, you went through many years of suffering from PTSD through, you know, from this experience. So you've been through this walk, you understand what it takes to develop resilience, look for that hope and walk through this. Yes, and and I rejected that knowledge of having PTSD for a long time, too, which was just part of my story. I didn't want to have it. I didn't want to know about it. I didn't want to be the Ginny Buckingham who was blamed for 9-11. I wanted to be who I used to be. And once I stopped kind of rejecting it and understood it better, I learned that because I wasn't allowing myself to process what had happened and grieve it, it was holding me back. And, you know, I I equate it to having an elevator full of your pain and emotions, like stuck deep down inside yourself. And unless you let that elevator come back up and let those emotions go through you and let you, you know, feel your grief, you get, you get stuck there. Um, And, you know, it took me many years to um, let myself feel the pain of what happened. Do you feel that being able to open up to the pain and and feel that is what started the healing process for you? I think so. I think, I think coming to terms with, with what happened and accepting it and accepting who I was and really coming to understand why it all happened. You know, I blamed myself for many years as well, because I believed the people who were blaming me because I, I'm a person I've worked in the media for many years. I have worked in politics and I trusted those voices more than I trusted my own. So I think it was really coming to understand that I needed to hold on what I knew was true deep down inside and not let others define for me what was true. I know you, in your book, you talk about that we need to be our own heroes. I'd love for you to share with our listeners what that means. So it's that, that sense of wanting someone to save me, um, you know, especially women and little girls um, in our culture, you know, that idea of the you know, shine, knight in shining armor riding in and saving the day is something we all grew up with, that romantic vision. And in my case, 
I thought of it as, you know, a newspaper coming out and saying, you know, sorry, we were wrong. Um, You weren't to blame at all. Whoops, got it wrong. Or a political leader um, saying, saying that, you know, President Bush um, was someone who I knew through, through politics. And for many years, I wanted him to, to say publicly that it wasn't my fault, which is, you know, a, a kind of silly thing to want, because obviously, um, at the time, he had bigger things to do. And, you know, why, why would that be on his list? But it's something I wanted, I craved it, actually. Um, and I had to free myself of that need because one, it wasn't going to happen. Um, and two, even if it did, I wondered if it, I wonder if it really would have mattered now that I understand that it was, you know, that finding my own hero being my own hero is really what it was going to take. So, I mean, my goodness, I mean, you experienced so much through all this. What were some of the dangers you experienced as being a scapegoat of this crisis? So, I mean, the danger was to myself and my personal survival, I guess I would say. Um, You know, I had suicidal thoughts, um, thought about, was it better for my little children who were babies when this happened for someone who was their mom to be so broken? Would it be better for them not to have me? I never acted on it, um, but I thought about it. And um, being able to be, you know, fully engaged in my life as their mom um, was really, I think, what ultimately helped me because I was determined not to put this on them. You know, they didn't do anything wrong, nor did I, but I wasn't going to ruin their life because I was so, so pained. Yeah, that's, that's a tough place. And I think a lot of people, you know, would feel that way too. And I, you know, believe your story is a real shining light of hope for people who are going through difficult times going, gosh, you know what, this might be what I'm thinking, but you know what, there's always another way. I hope so. You know, there's not a lot of good that can come from bad, but sometimes you find your way to do good um, with a painful situation. And I hope my story, which is about navigating an incredible painful time, does resonate for people because, you know, while it's launched from 9-11, my story, the kind of trauma and pain and um, anguish can happen and, and does happen from many situations. And it would be an incredible gift to me if my story helps others. With so many people going through COVID-19, and it's, I, I know I'm, uh, I can't make a parallel here, but there are some symptoms that are happening when people, we talk about depression, people feeling helpless, you know, what are some of the thoughts that you can give people to help build resilience and, and just to feel like things are going to be okay through this time? You know, I think it's be patient with yourself. and if on one day you're in a very dark place and don't see a path forward. Um, I used to um, sit on my couch and and when I had those kind of days and, you know, surround myself as much as I could with beauty, light candles and have fresh flowers and just tell myself that I would try again tomorrow. And sometimes that's courage is just being willing to try again the next day. And I, and I think that is a, is, a good incremental way to move forward during this very anxious time. You know, the people who say, Oh, I'm you know thriving. I'm getting all my projects done. (laughs) I mean, that that's great for them, but many people don't feel that way. And just, just trying um, each day is sometimes all you can do to move forward. Yeah. I would say that a majority of people are not just sitting back at home, you know, checking things off their honey do list. Most people are looking at this time. Yeah. You know, there's great transition, turmoil, uncertainty, you know, people have lost their jobs. So we look at all this and it's like, gosh, you know, how am I going to move forward today? And I think that's good. You know what, just, you know, wake up and do it again tomorrow. I think so. And, you know, there are a lot of people who, um, either have lost their jobs or or will lose their jobs. And, you know, for me, that was a big blow because I'd spent many years building um, a successful career. And I only 
knew that I had one capability that I thought I could apply in another capacity. And that was, I was a writer. So that's what I pursued. But, you know, I've been asked, you know, what would you tell people who need to start over in their career? And it's, you know, what is it that you may have always cherished about yourself, some skill, some capability, some dream that you weren't able to pursue or didn't pursue for a lot of reasons? You know, maybe now's the time. Maybe now you're being forced into a different path. And maybe it can be a path that you, you, always dreamed you could choose. Yeah. I mean, this time's really giving us, you can look at it as like, it's a really difficult time, which of course it is, but it also provides opportunity, you know, and I love how you share in your story, how you, you know, started writing and then things, you know, yes, people signed a petition. They have no idea what's going on. You know, no one really gets the truth. They're just hearing what's reported in the news and then you had people later come to you and say, gosh, you know, I signed it and I, it was before I knew you and kind of like apologizing about that. Yeah, uh, that, that gave me a, a lot of um, um, happiness because I never tried to find out who signed the petition, you know, because I thought I didn't want it to affect my relationships um, that I was trying to build in the new, new job. And so I just put my head down and I worked hard and, you know, ultimately, again, like you said, they didn't know me, but they came to know me. And I think that that applies in a lot of situations as well, that we you know, have these two dimensional ideas of who people are just based on what we briefly think or heard or saw on social media. And, you know, that's not true of anyone, you know, uh, our political leaders, our, our neighbors, our, everyone's three dimensional and it, it, it's worth trying to get to know who they are really um, in our lives. So what are some tips that you would give our listeners who, you know, are rebuilding their life, looking at new um, areas to pursue? What are some things you would, you know, encourage them with? Um, Take your time if you can. Um, Really reflect and reset if you can, if you can give yourself that, that time. I didn't pursue a new career for over a year and a half, um, partially because I was pregnant on 9-11 and had my baby, partially because I wasn't exactly a hot property at the time um, in, in, in the job market, but I took, I took time. And um, I think that thoughtful reset of your path is, is really worth it. It might be the only time in your life you have that chance. So, you know, as being a self-made female business leader, what are some of the skills that have translated in your life from, you know, the careers that you've worked to what you're doing now? Um, You know, I would say the courage to speak up has been a big thing. Even when I was in my 20s and I was advising to governors um, and ultimately became their chief of staff, somehow, some way... um, myself who was seventh of eight children and didn't have a lot of opportunity to speak up as a kid, um, spoke up and told them what I thought and gave them my opinion. And I was never afraid. I guess that's the big thing. Um, I was never really afraid of anything and, um, applying that call it courage, um, maybe to any, anything you do as a woman leader, I think is really important. And I also think authenticity is really important. Um, some of the reactions I've gotten to my story have been from women who have, you know, had a hard time and, or a career setback. And they said, well, what do you tell people? Like when you're looking for a new job, what do you tell them? And I say that, tell them the truth, <laughs> tell them what happened, be authentic. That authenticity is so, so key. So, you know, courage and authenticity will get you a long way. Well, that's so important because the right job is going to be okay with that. Whatever it is that you tell them, they're going to be like, oh, okay, well, we appreciate you being honest, you know, and, and look at, you know, you as a whole person as it re- in regards to just one event. You know, and I, I wonder, and I've seen it in my, my current job, I've been working from home um, since March, like many people who are in office type jobs and you get to see people in a real way that you probably never did in the office environment. You know, they're in their own homes. There's, you know, dogs running around barking. There's, you know, kids that need things or 
what have you. And, and you kind of start to see an authenticity in the relationships that you have with people at work. So I think there will be even more, more of an openness um, to who people really are perhaps than there was before. I know you talk about that. There's no 100% true safety. What do you mean by that? No, I think we want, 100% safety for ourselves and for our families who, who wouldn't, of course we do, but it's not real. You know, there, there's no guarantee. Life is very fragile. I think that's part of, um, if we didn't blame so easily and instead accepted the fragility of life and did everything we could obviously to keep, um, our families and ourselves safe and government should do everything they can to keep societies safe um, but ultimately, it's not 100% guaranteed. And so what would that mean if we really acknowledge that? And what would it mean as leaders? What kind of choices would leaders make? What kind of choices would we as citizens make if we accepted that there was no such thing as 100% safety? You know, I think it's, you know, kind of a wake up, you know, a little bit of a wake up call because then people realize, hey, you know what? Things happen that we can't predict. I mean, no one predicted 9-11. No one could predict that that would happen. No, no one did. I mean, different pieces of the story, I think, were floating out there. Not anything that I knew, but perhaps in the intelligence community. But, you know, if they could have put the pieces together and stopped it, they would have. And, you know, that looking back with 2020 hindsight is a very common thing, but it's not helpful. And I see it now with the pandemic, um, because, of course, there were people in different corners of the world, um, epidemiologists or others saying, you know, this could happen. Um, But saying this could happen is not the same thing as absolutely knowing and governments all coming together and preparing for something that they hadn't really considered. Um, And I think we have to accept that and accept that what we learn from these things is the key by not blaming, but coming together and figuring out how to address it so that we're better the next time. You know, we haven't had an attack at the scale of 9-11 since then, thank God. There have been some, you know smaller attacks, but nothing like that because we learned. We learned what was possible and we took measures, um, multiple measures to um, make sure it didn't happen again. Yeah, I mean, and that, I mean, 9-11, the COVID event, all this could be, you know, kind of, you look at how they can really kind of relate because, you know, my goodness, there are things that we just can't predict. And as a society, you know, blaming doesn't help, but going through and figuring out, okay, what do we do to prevent this? What do we do to be better? I think is the way to go. Yeah. And, and that is the case at every level. Um, you know, leadership is required at every level as an individual citizen, um, all the way up, obviously, to, to leaders of, of governments is to look at what we can do to help solve the problem. And, you know, I even say to, to friends and, and, and neighbors, you know, it doesn't help for you to put out a nasty tweet or a nasty Facebook post about, um, you know, the superintendent of schools didn't, you know, give us the right information at the right time or quickly enough about how our schools were going to proceed or the governor, you know, kept schools or businesses closed too long, like all, all those negative kind of blaming, kind of lashing out. That's not leadership at, at, at any level, citizen um, or anyone else. So if you had to give advice to people that are going through COVID right now, I know we've covered quite a bit. What, what thoughts would you want to leave them with? I would say um, to move forward from this, knowing that some fundamental things have changed. And for those who have lost loved ones, um, so horrible the healthcare workers around the front lines who have done all that they can, but I'm sure are going to suffer from trauma um, and blame and all the other things, um, you know, move forward, holding on to what you know is true and give yourself time and recognize that being changed forever by something doesn't mean you can't build a life on that foundation of loss. Um, that is a, the common human experience to build a new life of meaning and joy, cognizant of the foundation of loss. And we all have to do it. We all can do it. 
I think that's so important. My goodness. Well, you know, Virginia, where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your book and be part of your community? Uh, I would love that. Um, www.virginiabuckingham.com is my website and you can leave your email there um, to be part of um, this story. And my book's available anywhere you can buy books um, online these days, um, given what's going on. And, you know, I really um, am grateful for the opportunity to talk to you about my story and grateful to anyone who takes the time to read it. And, you know, if they take anything from it that helps, helps them or their communities, um, that's a real gift. Well, Virginia, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Well, thank you, Virginia. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to hear your story and talk about your new book, On My Watch. On My Watch is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and select indie retailers. And of course, you can order it on Kindle. Again, if you'd like to connect with Virginia, you can at virginiabuckingham.com for more information. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here's where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with our next special guest, Tina Gilbertson, and she's here to share with us her new book, Reconnecting with Your Estranged Adult Child, Practical Tips and Tools for Healing Your Relationship. Now, Tina is a psychotherapist and author. Her work has been featured in Forbes, Fast Company, Glamour, Real Simple, and Red Book. In 2019, she co-founded the Reconnection Club, offering education, community, and support to help estranged parents repair their relationship with their adult children. So let's welcome to the show, Tina Gilbertson. Thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you for having me on the show. I really am looking forward to chatting with you. Oh my goodness. You know, this is a great book. And right now, with so much division going on, I can imagine a better book. Right. Yeah. And, and this pandemic is really highlighting the separation and the, and the sense of disconnect that was already there to begin with. So it's a pretty tough time for, for people who are estranged from family. So why don't you share with us, you know, what was the inspiration behind writing this book? 
Oh, well, I've been working for years with uh, parents whose adult children are estranged for them. And the way that started was that I had people in my, I'm a therapist, and I had people in my therapy room telling me about their parents and how much they didn't want to go home for holidays. They didn't like it when their parents called and all of this stuff. And I didn't meet their parents, but I thought, gosh, their parents must be devastated by this. And and when I asked, you know, how much do your parents understand the reasons for for this? I would get answers like, well, they, I, I can't really talk to them. They don't understand it. Or um, I've tried and tried to tell them what the problems are, but they just don't get it. And so I thought, gosh, I need to write some things down and share them with parents because if I'm getting this information and they're not, then this is wasted. So I started writing. I wrote a little blog post and then I wrote another and I started hearing from just dozens and dozens of parents wanting more information. So I wrote this hundred page PDF called the guide for parents of estranged adult children. And I thought, well, I'll just put that out there and that will give them all these ideas and all this information that I've got for them. And I, I had that uh, on my website for several years. And eventually I heard from people all over the world saying, do you have this in my language? And I thought I have to turn this into a real book. So I expanded that original guide and it turned into reconnecting with your estranged adult child, which is uh, just came out. So you use the word specifically estranged. Why did you use that word? Well, it covers a lot of bases. Estrangement, I mean, it's it's kind of a fancy $5 word and not everybody uses it. So it can be hard for people to find help. Um, but I, I wasn't exactly sure what other word to use because estrangement really covers not talking at all, you know, you haven't heard from somebody for 10 years, but it also covers seeing somebody weekly or monthly and just feeling like a stranger from someone in your family, which is a horrible feeling, especially when you used to be close. And it also covers a troubled relationship that where sometimes maybe you don't talk and then other times you get together and you try to make it work but then then you you go silent again so it covers a lot of ground estrangement that's why i used the word and i think more people are becoming familiar with it not sure how but they do seem to be finding uh the book and uh and some other things that i have out there on the internet so how is estrangement different you know like different than just like ignoring or not speaking to one another well sometimes i think about the silent treatment and when when are we dealing with that as opposed to estrangement and that's a really good question i think of in general i mean there are some similarities but in general the silent treatment is purposeful and punitive it's you know you said something that i didn't like and i want you to know that i didn't like it so i'm not going to talk to you for a little while and then you'll get the message so it is it's purposeful it has it has usually a, a shelf life, you know, especially if we live in the same home or the same town, it, it, it maybe only lasts a few days or weeks, not always, but, but typically. That's the silent treatment. But estrangement, I think the central difference is that estrangement is not usually punitive. There's been a lot of research, not enough, but there's been a lot of research be- about estrangement between parents and their adult children, and and the adult children are the ones who are cutting off. And in no case that I've ever heard of, either in the literature or in my experience, have I ever heard an adult child saying, I'm cutting my parents off because I want to hurt them. I want to really stick it to them. I want them to be hurt. Uh it, 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 it's estrangement is self-protective and, and it, it's basically saying, I don't know what else to do except retreat from this relationship. So unlike the silent treatment where I'm, I'm mad at you and I want you to know that you did something that I didn't like, and I never want you to do it again in estrangement. I'm just protecting myself. I don't know how to fix this, but the relationship is somehow painful to me. So I'm just going to retreat and that has the effect of hurting usually the, the other person, but it is not as intentional as the silent treatment. 
So what is emotional estrangement? Because I know you mentioned that in your book, and I was really, you know, the different types of estrangement that are there. I mean, you have quite a bit, and it was very interesting to read those. Yeah, and this is something that um, isn't isn't talked about a lot. It's the second of the three types that I mentioned when I was talking about estrangement, which is where you do have contact. And if you call your adult child, they will call you back either right away or eventually. Maybe you even go out for coffee or have lunch together. Or maybe you do holidays together. But or there, maybe there are even visits and the grandchildren come over and all of that. So from the outside, everything looks fine, especially for people who never get to see their kids. They think, wow, aren't you lucky? But, but what is experienced emotionally is a devastating sense of uh, separation, distance. It's psychological rather than physical or logistical. So, you know, we used to be close. We used to be able to talk about all kinds of things. I used to feel comfortable around my child, and now I feel like I'm walking on eggshells. Now I feel like things aren't right between us, even though we're getting together. So that's how, that's what I think of as emotional estrangement as opposed to just sort of standard, we're not, you know, low contact, um, um, hostile or difficult contact. Those are different. So what are some of the reasons that uh, relationships go through an estrangement? What are some of the things that you commonly see? Well, between parents and adult children, that's most of the research on estrangement is between parents and adult children. And most of it focuses on estrangement uh, initiated by the adult child. And there have, there are many sort of um, uh, factors that have been found to to contribute to this um, from anything from um, you know money issues to uh, third parties getting in the way um, to just different values politics uh, socioeconomic status family size you know people are people in smaller smaller families. Um, it's kind of easier to estrange from a smaller family because you don't have this huge family network saying, why haven't you called your mother? You know, there's a lot more pressure in a large family. So that's a kind of a surprising factor. But what it comes right down to, if you talk to someone who is cutting off from family is usually something like feeling um, somehow um, unloved, dismissed, disrespected, invisible, not feeling good in the relationship. Um, so, it, so the relationship is painful for the person who's cutting off. That is really in most cases, if we're not talking about a, a stage of development here where really they're just desperate to get some independence, if we're not talking about that, then in most cases it is some kind of suffering that has led to a desire for distance. So how can, you know, people tell if they are estranged? That's an interesting question. I think there is a certain amount of subjectivity to it. Different people who have looked at this define it in different ways. I mean, there are people, quantitative researchers out there who will simply say, if you haven't talked to your family in X number of months or you have this many contacts over this amount of time, then you are estranged. I I think it is more subjective. If you feel um, like there is a, an unwillingness or a, to, to get together or a distance that you wish wasn't there or that you feel, depending on what side you're on, that you feel needs to be there. I think that's more indicative of estrangement. I mean, think about what what does a relationship look like when you are not estranged. Well, you feel comfortable in in contact with each other. There may be some feeling of closeness, some some reliance on each other for for support, emotional or whatever. Um, so I think it is largely subjective, but usually there is some uh, impact on contact, whether that's there's less contact or there's really um, troubled contact where there's a lot of um, vitriol or 
or there's too much um, silence or something that that's not pleasant. I'm so glad you took the time to go over that because I think a lot of times, you know, when uh, young people leave the house and they're adults, I mean, there is a separation that happens. But then when you Mm -hmm. talk about estrangement, it could be a, you know, it's a massive divide. So being able to tell like, Hey, I'm, I'm, is this, are we having problems in the relationship that we need to fix? Or is this just, you know, them, you know, them being independent? Yeah. And that is very important to understand. Sometimes a young person who, or, or a person who's launching from, for the first time, this could be a person in his forties, you know, who's, who's always been very close and is finally flying the nest. It's not entirely about age, but somebody who's recently launched may need a, a, a surprising amount of space from the parent's point of view. And the parent may feel very much estranged, like there's a problem here. We are not close anymore. My child isn't coming to me for the same advice they used to come to me for. It feels much more pathological in a way, problematic from the parent's point of view than from the child's. The child may be nervous about it because the child may feel sense that the parents need to stay close. So that turns it into a problem for the child as well. But particularly when we're talking about just a need for independence, I think that often the parents are more concerned about it than the child because they fear that this means they've lost their child forever. And if you think about that, that's, that's terrifying. Of course, you want to try to fix whatever's wrong. If it means that if you if you do nothing, your child will just move further and further and further away until they disappear forever. That's terrifying. But that that is not usually what happens. So it is much more of a fear than a fact for most parents. So as parents start to dive into, okay, so what's the reason for all this detachment and estrangement? What are some things that you suggest they do and don't do? One thing to do is to take into account the phase of your child's development. If you're talking about a 20, 21-year-old, you you must take into account this, the phase of life that they're at. And actually, any any there are a lot of life phases, right, that 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 people go through, including getting married and having children of your own. So I think it's important for the parent to take into account the fact of where their child is at in life in part so that they don't completely personalize, oh, my child isn't calling me, they must not like me anymore. You know, it may be that your child is in college or is in medical school and, and, isn't, and is super duper busy or whatever. So that's one thing. Take, take the context of your child's life into account. But also, because things are complicated and it's not always just one thing going on, you might want to reflect on any sort of complaints or problems that that your child has had in in adolescence. Um, a really uh, contentious adolescence is a risk factor for estrangement later in life. So if you had a really tough time with your child when he or she was a teenager, that is something to reflect on and really kind of get educated on what 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 is needed at that time of life. What are some things that parents often do with teenagers that maybe don't go over so well? What what might have been different? So that if necessary, you can not only understand what happened, but also apologize if necessary for, you know, I wish I had done that differently. I wish I'd known better. I wish I'd, I'd given you more space. I wish I hadn't criticized or whatever it is. So I think it's helpful to educate yourself about some of the issues that, that happen between parents and children. And that includes taking an intergenerational look at what were your teen years like and your whole childhood. I mean, what, what sort of experience did you have as a young person and what did you need that you got? What did you need that you maybe didn't get? And, and how does that whole intergenerational process look in your family? Do you find that there could be some issues that parents are bringing into their relationship with their children that they haven't dealt with? 
oh, that's almost certainly the case in, in, in most cases. And a lot of times that doesn't have, a, you know, a terrible, devastating impact. But sometimes very much so there is a kind of an invisible intergenerational thing playing out. And I mentioned that in the book, I think there was an example of somebody who didn't get a lot of attention or love when she was a child growing up and she swore to herself that her children would never feel neglected or deprived. And so she became a super duper mom and was always focused on her kids, there for her kids, really made being a mother her her top priority and then felt uh, hurt and confused and kind of resentful when the kids grew up and, and didn't want to spend quite as much time because she had made this incredible investment in them based on her own unmet needs. So a parent's unmet needs are often a source of what can develop into trouble between them and their kids. Because as long as something is invisible to you and you're, and you're acting with this other individual who happens to be your child, but is a different person from you, if you are kind of maybe projecting kind of what maybe you needed or, or how parenting should go, maybe, you know, this is, this is what my parents did and I didn't quite like it, but now, you know, that's what parents do. So I'm going to do that too. And you have to put up with it because I did. There's all kinds of intergenerational stuff. So yes, if, if parents haven't really explored and examined their own experience without p- placing blame on anybody, not their own parents, not themselves, this is something that is just simply intergenerational stuff that all families have. But if you haven't, if you don't look at that, you really don't necessarily know how much it has an impact on the way you're relating to your child. Well, and so what would you suggest, let's say, if the relationship has some toxic factors, maybe the parents are abusive or there are addiction problems in the home and, you know, and the children are estranged because of that. What are some thoughts around that? Well, abuse is a tough one because when you have been abused, you, A, may not even realize it. And you you may either feel abused by your children, which which definitely does happen, or you unconsciously perpetuate behaviors that are harmful to them um, because th- there is a certain, um, you know, we get used to the families that we have. And so if we grow up with being uh, verbally abused, we may not see that as verbal abuse. I mean, we may not see that as abuse at all because it's so normal. So one thing, if your child accuses you of abuse, you want to get really clear on, well, what is abuse? I mean, is it possible that I was abused myself and have uh, unwittingly and uh, without at all meaning to have somehow passed on some of those dynamics in my relationship. So that is really, really difficult and very deep work. It's hard to do on your own. I definitely recommend therapy, uh, local therapy with uh, maybe even a trauma specialist if you do have abuse in your own relationship or sorry, in your own family. And a lot of people say, you know what, I grew up being abused, and I swore I would never do that to my children. That that happens a lot. And uh, most of these people, I, I think, probably do a lot better than they were done by. But the fact of untreated trauma means that certain things can come out around the edges that you don't even see, don't even realize have an impact on your child. So I highly recommend therapy if abuse uh, was a part of your experience, your own experience. And same with addiction. Addiction definitely has an impact on children when they grow up around around addiction or using substances at early ages. So these are things to seek professional help with, I think. 
So I'm sure you get this quite often. So let's talk about the daughter and, or son-in-laws. So uh-huh. if, they, if they're in the picture, you're, you have a great relationship with your child until the daughter or, son, or son-in-law comes into the picture. And then all of a sudden that's over. What are some thoughts around that and, and how that can be dealt with? Yeah. Well, of course, whoever your child hooks up with is going to have an influence on them. There's no question about that. There is an influence there. But but that's something that you can't have any control over. So I like to focus on what what can you control? What what do you have an impact in? So you can't control who this person is or how they are or whether they even want you around. And I do feel for people who have difficult in-laws. I really do because it's kind of a lottery and some people just don't, don't win. But you also have to ask sometimes, um, sometimes a partner can be used as a kind of a shield. If, if a child, let's say the good son or the good daughter doesn't want to ask for space from parents because he knows that that would be hurtful. So he allows his wife or his girlfriend to be the one who's kind of in the way, be the one who holds the, let's not get together with your parents this weekend. So sometimes, certainly not in all cases, but but I would look at whether this might be the case that your very good child, who's always been so close and always been so there for you, why, you know, that they picked this person, they picked this person who is so clearly not wanting to get together with you. Is it possible that that person is serving as your child's just sort of built in distance so that he can get, uh, you know, a little bit more autonomy? So that's one thing to think about. And that's, that's a hard one, I think, for parents who see their child as blameless and the child's spouse as as a demon you know so it's a, it's a kind of a different thought but but if if that is not the case um you know it kind of comes down to you you have to have the best relationship you can with your child's spouse even if that person is a total jerk if you think about it, why are people jerks? If a person is acting like a jerk, just in, in brief, I usually think of that as this person's been really hurt before somehow. This person doesn't trust people. Um, this person has has some stuff. And, and here I come along and I remind this person of their own mother. And suddenly I'm persona non grata in their home. But there's so... And it's hard to get along with people who are very insecure or or have a chip on their shoulder against you. It goes without saying that that's a really really tough tough thing to do. But but one wants to try one's best because what you don't want to do is feed into an escalating situation where it's it's not clear who dislikes whom more. And just to, particularly with mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law, you also want to look at if, if I'm a mother, is my daughter-in-law perhaps threatened by some of the ways that I show up in in their home? Like, am I just tr- am I trying to be helpful uh, so much that the daughter-in-law feels I'm trying to take over, or the daughter-in-law feels like I'm judging her ability to clean her house, or I'm judging her childcare? So, uh, if the daughter-in-law doesn't seem to like the mother-in-law, it may be a vying for power within her own sphere. So those are some things to think about with a with an in-law, with your child's spouse or partner. I think I know exactly what you mean. I have a friend who had called her son, who's an adult son who's married, to make sure he had enough uh, socks for a trip. <laughs> and she knows who she is. And so we laugh about this all the time because I called her up and she's like, well, my daughter-in-law doesn't like me. I'm like, you think, why would she, why would she like you? You're calling to ask her husband if he's got socks. Isn't that kind of something she should work out with him? You know? <laughs> yeah. 
So, but some yeah. of it can be a little comical if you look at that and it's just it like shifts in perspectives to be able to say, okay, yeah. you know, how is this making the other person feel? How's it making my daughter-in-law feel when I'm calling up her husband, even though I am the mom, you know, doing these kind mm-hmm. of things? Yeah, right. That's exactly right. That's a good point. Perspective taking is really, really important when you're trying to repair relationships. And that's the solution to estrangement is to make repairs rather than to wait and hope that someone changes their mind or sees the light and and sees you differently. Um, I think being proactive, and that doesn't always mean reaching out if someone's been asked for no contact. It, it, reaching out without without respecting that request might might backfire. But it does mean being proactive in making repairs, however those might look like. It might look like respecting a no-contact request, or it might look quite different. But it is important to think about the estrangement as something that you can have an impact on, even if it's something you didn't want. You have some power and control over what you do, how you think about it, and how you approach the problem. So and we've talked quite a bit about different things and things for people to look out for and, and tips on how to assess it. What are some tools that they can use to start mending those relationships that they can do on their own? You mean that that doesn't involve talking to your child or reaching out to them? Well, do you know that starts that process either of you know, reaching out, um, starting that conversation, you know, up to the point where you may need to get a a counselor, you know, so, you know, just a Mm -hmm. little, a couple tips that they can use to maybe start making baby steps in that direction. I think the very, very first thing to do if you're in shock and you've been cut off by someone you love is to take a minute and breathe, Uh, not to panic and think, well, this is it. If I don't fix this today, it's game over. Because that's not true. So number one is breathe, breathe. You don't have to fix this right away. Uh, And then number two would be to come to some understanding. And this is difficult because a lot of parents have shame about their parenting. And, and, and there's, you know, all good parents feel, feel like they could have done better. I mean, that's just part of having such a huge role in someone else's life is knowing that you can never be get it a hundred percent. Right. And, and feeling, you know, regret. Well, I wish I'd known that when, when he was five, but I didn't, you know, there are a lot of regrets and shame and that can lead to a kind of defensive stance of, of not being open to understanding why, why did my child cut me off? Why does she want distance from me? It's a very, very painful question to try to answer, Uh, but it is absolutely imperative that you do understand things and try to really see, even though your child will see things from a different perspective that you could say, "Mm -mm, didn't happen or never meant that, or it wasn't like that in our house. I don't know why on earth they would think that. And, And often that's the case. Even still, seeking to understand how it could be that one of your three children had a difficult childhood and the other two think their childhood was great. So after you take a moment to breathe and not panic and realize this is probably temporary, because most estrangements apparently are temporary, then number two is understand what happened. Try to understand what happened from your child's point of view so that number three you can use the best relationship repair tool under the sun, which is a good apology. And you can apologize even though you never meant to hurt your child. Uh, you don't have to be a, a bad person, a villain, uh, or anything, or admit that you're terrible to apologize. You just have to be a good person who realizes, ah, I seem to have done some damage here without meaning to, without knowing it. And then a good apology acknowledges that and really sees the other person's pain. So I think the um, not panicking is, is important. Understanding is a, is a step you can't skip. And the apology is the ultimate relationship repair tool. 
Thank you so much for going over that. That's so important because at the end of the day, do you want to be right and be in a relationship that's estranged from your child? Or do you want to have a relationship with your child? Yeah, exactly that. You're absolutely right. And it's a, it's a tough one. When when you, you are feeling hurt yourself or you're, you're feeling just, uh, you know, when you're not at your best and, and you just feel kicked to the curb, uh, I think sometimes it feels better to think, well, there's something wrong with my child because that, you know, I don't, there's no reason for this. It feels better than, than saying, wow, my child, somehow I did some damage and I didn't realize it. So, yeah. Yeah, that's so important. Well, my goodness, Tina, your book, Reconnecting with Your Strange Adult Child, was so, I, I felt it was such a great read, so impactful. Where can our listeners connect with you, learn about your book, and be part of your community? The hub of everything I do is at my website, tinagilbertson.com. Well, Tina, thank you so much for being a guest on the show with us here today. It's been a pleasure, Marianne. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Tina. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, Reconnecting with Your Strange Adult Child, Practical Tips and Tools to Heal Your Relationship. Again, if you'd like to connect with Tina, you can at her website, tinagilbertson.com, for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.